Hello and welcome back. And today we're working on the Centurion, but we're not working on this Centurion, nor are we working on this Centurion, and we're not even working on this Centurion. And yeah, that is indeed a Centurion. No, we're not working on any of these today. Instead, we're working on... We are working on this Centurion. I flew all the way to Tennessee to see this thing. This is a Micro Plus, and it's not mine. It's actually Aaron's here. So Aaron, why don't you give us the who, what, where, why, when, and how? I'd be happy to, and really happy to have you here, David. It's uh, a, thank you. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you. My name is Aaron Ishmael. I own the Vintage Geek Museum, which is where we are today. This is my way of sharing experiences with vintage computing with the world. We have uh, different computers from various brands over the time span of the late 70s all the way until the early 90s. And we have the Centurion Micro Plus that was actually acquired during one of our kind of warehouse hunts. We were in a storage unit in Florida going through an entire collection collection and this particular Centurion actually I saw the terminal right off the bat with its blue color and it stood out to me and I thought wow this is really interesting I've never seen one like this before then we saw the rest of the system and a pile of equipment and uh, I had to acquire it and of course upon acquiring it I realized very quickly that uh, there was no real information available on it online so it kind of went on the back burner for a while as a to-do project and then uh, one of the viewers of our YouTube channel for the museum actually told me about David and Usagi Electric and we were able to communicate and I'm really excited to have David here so that we can uh, learn more about the system and possibly get it running. So there you have it guys. Uh, this is Aaron's Centurion Micro Plus. Well, that's our goal today is to try and get it running but I am extremely excited to be here at Vintage Geek. I uh, heard about this because of this but as I started looking into it this is like a really cool museum uh, and he does uh, weekly YouTube videos. Uh, I hope weekly. I hope I'm not putting the pressure on you there. Most but, weeks. <laughs> most weeks. Uh, he does weekly YouTube videos so there's a link in the description before. Check out uh, his YouTube channel. He's got a lot of really great stuff in here, but we need to get to work on this Micro Plus. But before we start taking it apart, let's figure out what is the Micro Plus, because this doesn't look like my Centurion at home at all. So what is the Micro Plus? This doesn't look like the Centurion that you guys are used to seeing, uh, which is a huge tall cabinet that's about five feet tall and has a massive Hawk drive in it. But this is an honest-to-God Centurion mini computer inside. It has the very same CPU 6, 128K memory card, MUX card, and Finch floppy controller that we have in the big boy Centurion at home. But you can see it clearly fits on a desk. This thing is tiny, and actually you can, you can pick it up and carry it around. Well, the Micro Plus uses a very unique four-slot backplane that holds just those four cards, because if we're talking about a minimal system, well, that's the only four cards that you desperately need to get the system running. And then this big box here on the bottom holds the drives. There's an eight-inch floppy drive in there, and there is an eight-inch hard drive, which is a Finch drive. This is actually the exact same drive that we got off of the counterfeit system that, that I still haven't gotten running yet, but you know, that's on the to-do list. We'll use this as a primer for getting to work on that drive. Uh, and so <laughs> this was Centurion's entry into the desktop-sized computing market. Only instead of being a PC compatible, like that EDS PC that we saw at the beginning, this is a full-fledged multi-user mini computer. This thing is epic. It's also incredibly rare. To see one in person is just staggering. As far as I know, these were mostly sold to credit unions, so they very rarely actually made it into regular users' hands. So I have no idea what the history of this one is, but I do know that the history of it from this point forward is that it's going to be here at the Vintage Geek, and the goal is to get it running. So we're going to have to take it completely apart, make sure nothing's going to explode as soon as we put power into it, bring it up incrementally, and hopefully 
by the end of the day, we have a working system. At the very least, though, I'm aiming for a D equals prompt, because that Finch drive really scares me. But there's really only one way to find out, and that's to get down and get to work. So let's get to it. We'll start with working on the terminal, and to get the top off this ads Regent 40, there are two screws on the back and two screws on the front that you get from the bottom side. Then the top lifts right off with ease, and right off the bat, one of the caps looks a little sketchy, but uh, let's try flipping the power switch on anyways, and yeah, nothing, not a zip zero zilch. So uh, looking closer, one of the resistors next to a regulator IC looks absolutely scorched. And I don't have any spare caps with me, but I do have some spare resistors. So let's snip this one out and see if we can replace it. And I think it's a 220 ohm resistor based on the one color band I can see and the relative size of a resistor on a different regulator. We'll give it one more shot and yeah, nope, it's still nothing. Given the time crunch and the lack of replacement capacitors, let's shift focus to the main unit, which is held together with four screws on the bottom. And then it just slides forward really easily. And this thing is a marvel of packaging. There are four full-sized Centurion cards plugged into a custom four slot backplane. There's pretty good airflow set up and it's remarkably well designed. Let's get each card out, starting with the 128K DRAM memory card. Then we'll unplug the DMA cable, the data cable for the Finch, and the command cable for the Finch and Floppy. With those out of the way, the FFC card slides right out. And next up is the MUX card. We'll disconnect all the short extender cables that move the ports to the back of the machine, and then it slides right out as well, giving us good access to the CPU card. We'll disconnect the DMA cable and the front panel cable, then it just pops right out as well. And each card in here is identical to the cards in the main Centurion back home, which means we have reverse engineered schematics for everything except the 128K memory card. Although I don't think we'll need it. These things are built like tanks. Next, let's look at the drives. Uh, again, four screws and then the entire cage slides right out, just like the card cage did. And inside is a Cume Track 842 floppy drive, which is a double-sided, double-density drive. And next to it is the terrifying Finch drive. And this particular one looks like a 24 megabyte unit. Along the back, we have a plain Jane 150 watt linear power supply. And for first power up, we wanna make sure that the Finch at the very least is unpowered. So we'll tip the machine on its side and I'll try to get the power plug removed. It's a bit tight, but some fiddling later and I managed to get it. Well, it, it couldn't have been easy because when is anything ever easy? The terminal tripped us up because it has a, a bad power supply going on in it. I think we might be able to get that repaired tomorrow, but uh, so we aren't stuck doing nothing today. We tried to get another terminal going and me and my infinite wisdom left my uh, RS-232 to USB cable at home. So that was my fallback plan. So suddenly we didn't have a fallback plan, but Aaron here thankfully had a Windows 10 machine with a uh, serial port on it. So we can use that with TerraTerm, except that that's a, a DE9 serial port versus the DB25 that my cable here is supposed to go to. So I did some quick hackery out of a spare uh, DE9 cable that he had, wired it up into this machine. So right now we've got the Windows 10 machine up on TerraTerm, plugged into that. So I think we're going to try and power this thing on. Now we've unplugged the Finch drive, so it's not going to spin up at all. So we're not actually going to boot from anything. All we're looking for is a D equals prompt. That tells us that the CPU is working, the memory is working, the MUX card is working, and that it's looking for a drive and ready to go. The bootstrap will have bootstrapped the system. So I'm going to bring the camera in a little tighter so you can see the monitor and see if anything goes up in smoke. Hopefully nothing does. Uh, and we'll flip the big power switch on the back and see what happens. Okay, so all we're looking for is a D equals prompt up here. Aaron, if you would do the honors of okay. flipping that big switch. All right, we're gonna try this again. Last time we turned it on, there was a loud pop and then the camera shut off. I, I don't know what was going on. The loud pop 
sounded like it came from somewhere up here. Maybe it was floppy related, maybe it was power supply related, but the machine actually did seem to be running. However, we weren't getting a D equals prompt. But when I rechecked the settings on here, it was set to 9608E1 and it needs to be 9607E1. So I've changed that setting. We're gonna try it again. Aaron, would you flip the switch for me? Nothing up there, but we might need to hit the reset switch. Well, still not getting a D equals prompt, huh? Nope. All right. We'll get there. All right. It's not been an easy run of... <laughs> <laughs> it's like 10 o'clock at night here, uh, and we're, we're just getting started. But I, I, think, I think we've actually made some progress. We had a couple problems. Uh, one, like I said, our, our cabling was a nightmare. I, I still had it wired up wrong. Uh, we didn't have the correct ground wire wired up. That still didn't fix it. We were trying to put the Diag card in it. I did bring that with me. Um, but it turns out that this bootstrap ROM predates the Diag card. So it doesn't support the Diag card. And I didn't find that out until I gave uh, Ken Romain a call and he was like, yeah, that one probably predates it. So <laughs> the, the Diag card sent us down a path that we didn't need to be running down anyways. Uh, but I think we finally got it. We got all four cards in. Uh, the Finch drive is still unplugged. And so what's going to happen is when we turn the power switch on and hit the reset button on the front, it's going to try and boot uh, directly off of whichever drive we have selected, Finch or Floppy. Uh, but we don't have any of the control cables set up, and they're both unplugged, so it shouldn't boot. It should just give us an error, and we should see that error up here. So Aaron, can you flip the power on for me? We don't get anything yet because it boots up into a halt. Can you hit the reset button on the front? There we go. Yes. I can go to sleep. It says error. Never have I been so excited to see the word error in my life. But that tells me that the CPU is working, the memory is working, the MUX card is working. And well, we don't know about the FFC because that is the next goal. The next goal is to try and spin this Finch drive up, which is going to be terrifying. And I haven't made an executive decision where we're going to try that tonight or tomorrow morning. But this is good. I'm happy with this. We did try to power up the Finch, but it's totally dead. And worse, when powered up, it kills the entire power supply. So there's no 5 volt going anywhere. So something funky is going on. With the front panel removed, we'll start taking off the Finch mounting screws. And then we'll carefully extricate it from the drive chassis. And the back panel should come right off after removing the four screws, but this one is pretty old and the rubber isolators have stuck themselves to the PCB, but we eventually got it though. The main PCB is held in place with one more screw, and with it removed, I'm going to reach in behind the PCB and make sure that the spindle isn't seized. And Nope, it feels like the spindle bearings are still good. So next, let's isolate the PCB from everything else and start probing on it. And to get it out, we just unplug each connector one by one. And with it out and on the bench, there's the problem. A dead short between 5 volts and ground. Our best guess is that the Finch PCB died, taking the 5 volt power rail down with it, and the previous owners just pushed the system into the corner, thinking the whole thing was dead. We did lift a few caps to try to isolate the short, but it's going to take a lot more troubleshooting to get this thing going. Well, it can't always be easy, can it? We certainly didn't have an easy time with it, did we? We did not. We had a fun time, but not an easy one. That's right. <laughs> Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time, but we tried to get as much troubleshooting done on this as we can, and I think we got pretty far. We have confirmed pretty much that all of the boards in the uh, computer chassis are functioning. The CPU, the memory card, and the MUX card are working for sure, and I'm pretty confident that the FFC card is working. We just have drive issues. Uh, so the Finch drive is actually coming home with me. I only came here with two carry-ons, so that's going home as a carry-on. That's gonna be interesting getting through security with the Finch drive in my bag. We'll see how that goes, but it's gonna require proper troubleshooting. So we'll get it going along with my Finch drive at home as well. So we shifted focus over to the floppy drive, hoping to bring it up, but again, it was giving us troubles. So <laughs> we got the troubleshooting on it. It has a dead short between 24 volts and ground. 
What's the deal with you in shorts, man? I, I don't know, man. It's uh, it just seems to be the way it played out today. I know that. Well, that's why I wear pants. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so we're gonna get both of the drives up and going. Hopefully, I'm gonna work on the Finch. He's gonna work on the floppy. But there's also, you know, this is in a museum. We would like to have maybe something slightly more reliable. So we're also gonna get to work on a floppy emulator and maybe get that to him as well. But the ultimate goal is to get my system and his system up to operating at the same level using the same software so we can now trade files between each other. That's the goal, we'll get there. Uh, also, we gotta get his terminal up and going. We didn't quite get there on it. I'm pretty sure it's just got a bad power supply, but Aaron's gonna dig into that while I'm working on the Finch at home. And I will definitely be coming right back here with the Finch in tow, as well as hopefully some new software too. And we're gonna get this machine up and going. But if you wanna see this machine for yourself in person, even though it's not running yet, but it will be soon. Uh, if you wanna see it for yourself in person, well, Aaron, why don't you tell the people who you are, where you are, and how they can find you. Absolutely, we are Vintage Geek. We are a museum of all sorts of vintage computers, including the Centurion Micro Plus, which we are very pleased to have here. You can find out all the information about the museum, how you can get an appointment to set up a tour, and more at vintagegeek.com. There you go, vintagegeek.com. If you're in the area, if you're in the Knoxville area, come check it out, it's cool. He's got a lot of great stuff in here. But Aaron, I wanna thank you so much for having me here today. Oh, I will you. definitely be back and we're gonna get this thing going. That sounds right. great. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.